Hello, Tony. How are you? Good, good, good. Technology allows us to connect from across the world. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, let me give a small, uh, or let's wait for a couple of minutes. Okay. For more people to join, because we told them uh, 7 p.m. sharp, so uh, still we have two minutes. So uh, if we run out of time, and I know we will run out of time, do you want to yes. reconnect or do you yes. want to set it up for another day? No, uh, we will reconnect. So we will just uh, leave. I'll tell you when, when we need to leave. I will save the video. Then we will join again. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. It's okay. usually how it's done. Perfect. Yeah. First, let All me... All right. Whenever you're ready, I'm ready. I have a presentation up. I will try to skip through the presentation as quickly as I can. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, and first, let me thank you for actually giving us this time. And uh, I'm sure many people are uh, very interested to uh, uh, listen from you, Tony. Uh, you are actually very famous here in, uh, in the Arab region. Many people know you. Many people re read about your book already. And uh, I'm sure they have a lot of questions. They, uh, yeah. Many of them are a bit maybe confused on some topics. This presentation will uh, educate many people. We have a lot of uh, professionals uh, uh, also joining us today. They have many good questions also for you. Uh, and uh, it's always good to share that, uh, to share that experience. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. There's more yes. than one way to do things and it's good to share ideas. We always learn something. It's always a two-way street. Yes. So, so for, for now, I will close the comments so the okay. video will be more clearer. And uh, I'll give a small introduction in Arabic so uh, and yeah. then we can start our uh, session, yeah? All right, perfect. Okay. I think, I think we are now on time, so I think we should start. And more people are coming, I think. Okay, so, perfect. Okay, let me start in Arabic first. يعطيكم العافية جميعا. أشكركم على تواجدكم هنا معنا اليوم. أول شيء أحب أشكر طبعا أخوي محمد النيدي فار الديلر اللي يستضيفنا في أكاونت اليوم. طبعا اللي أكيد وايد منكم سمعوا عن توني سيلفا. هو باحث وكاتب في مجال الطيور في تربية الطيور. هو عنده خبرة أكثر من أربعين سنة في هالمجال. اشتغل في أكثر من مكان معروف أنتج أكثر من تقريبا 80% من أنواع الببغاوات فخبرة كبيرة جدا قدرنا أن نأخذ شوي من وقته اليوم أنه يبدأ يعطينا برزنتيشن عن, عن أساسيات الإنتاج عن بعض المشاكل اللي تواجه المنتجين عن التغذية السليمة الاعتناء في, في, في صغار الببغاوات فإن شاء الله أن نستفيد وتستفيدون أنا سكرت الكومنت عشان ما ما يطلع كلام يعني على وجه الرياض بس بتحصلون بوكس صغير على علامة استفهام هالبوكس ممكن تطرشون لنا أسئلتكم اللي مهتم عنده سؤال حق توني نهاية البرزنتيشن بيكون في مجال للأسئلة فإذا تبون ترسلوا لنا أسئلة وإحنا بنستقبلها إن شاء الله ونجاوب قدر الإمكان طريقة العرض بتكون توني بيتكلم طبعا بالإنجليزي أنا بعرض عندي البرزنتيشن بالعربي عشان قدر الإمكان أن الواحد يستفيد من المعلومات. فأنا الحين now Tony I'll flip my uh, screen so I show the presentation. Okay. I think it's, it's clear, yeah? Yep, and what I will do is I will say next and then we go to the next image. Okay, perfect. 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 First of all. So, uh, so the floor, uh, floor is yours. Yep, let me, um, let me thank you. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I am deeply honored to be here. I think that modern technology allows us to share knowledge and experience. I have been an aviculturist over 45 years. Um, next. If we can go to the next image. Um, and it's in my genetics. I have um, my great grandmother, my grandmother, and my father were aviculturists. Next. Here you have a picture of my great-grandmother with a Cuban Amazon um, being held by one of her workers. So I, have been an, I was born into an avicultural family. My father kept canaries and pigeons. Uh, my great-grandmother kept parrots. 
my grandmother kept pigeons, but it's the parrots that have always fascinated me. Next. My aviaries are located in Florida. The birds are kept outdoors because the climate here allows it. The coldest that we have ever experienced is zero degrees Celsius, but the average uh, temperature, if we look at all year, is 26 degrees with summer highs of 35. We do not experience what you experience, these very high temperatures, but we do experience a lot of rain and a lot of wind. Next. My birds are kept outside in a garden uh, with a lot of exotic trees. Many of these trees provide part of the food that they receive. I believe that when you breed birds, you must meet a number of conditions. You must have proper housing, proper nest, obviously a pair, the proper food, and you must keep the pair mentally active. There is a big, big factor that must be considered, and that is mental well-being of the birds. And I will give some examples later on in the presentation. Next. I have a small clinic so that we can address all issues, and we have two hand-rearing rooms. Next. The hand-rearing rooms are divided for chicks that were incubator hatched and chicks that were parents started. If a chick hatches in the nest, it is never mixed with incubator hatch chicks because many parrots will feed dried droppings, dried fecal matter to their offspring. We see this in macaws quite commonly in order for them to digest the B vitamins. B vitamins are very difficult to digest the first time around, so the parents eat the droppings and part of that goes to the chicks. That means that when that chick comes out of the nest, it will have a bacterial load that the chicks being parent reared from or being hand reared from day one do not have. We don't want this cross contamination. We achieve that much later on in life. Next. There are many ways to breed parrots and not all cages uh, and not all setups apply for all species. We know that the cage that you're seeing is for eclectus. Female eclectus are very dominant over a nest. Males tend to be submissive, and many times they fear the female. This type of nest, which is basically multiple cages, each one housing a female and a tunnel above so that the males can circulate. If a female is very aggressive, she's not going to have another female in her cage because females tend to live and defend a nest but the males can circulate and mate with a willing female. This would be the acceptable way of trying to colony breed a collectus, although it must be kept in mind that females are very dominant. Next. When we look at nest boxes, again, not all nest boxes are the same, and many species have personal wants and likes that are very unique. Here we see a St. Thomas conure. Most conures nest in termite nests. You're seeing a, a tree termite nest. And then the nest box to the right basically duplicates that. When they nest in a termite mound, they dig from the bottom, they go up, they do a C shape, and then they come down to build a nesting chamber. That's what that nest achieves. So when you breed birds, you need to be both creative in terms of nest boxes and cage design. Next. Nest boxes, um, as I said, can be key. We know that green conures of the genus Sitakara, white eyes, uh, blue crowned conures, uh, Thectocircus, like a nest that they can go in from the bottom. So they're actually going in from the bottom of the nest, there is a, a square area so the eggs don't roll out, and then they nest in there. Many species that are notorious for breaking eggs are given specially designed boxes so that there is a very narrow tunnel that leads from the entrance to the nesting chamber, as you see on the right. That type of nest is used for hawk-headed parrots, blue-headed macaws. These are species that have a reputation in aviculture for eating or breaking eggs. 
Next. The best lesson that I have ever had. I was 18 years old, and I went to visit a breeder here in the U.S. called Ramon Nogel. He was achieving incredible results with Amazon parrots. And he sat me down. I was 18 years old. I was naive. I was beginning to breed many big parrots. And he said, if you want to learn something, listen to your birds. They will talk to you. And I came home and I said, this man is crazy. They don't talk to me. I discussed this with my grandfather. And he said, you're not understanding what he's telling you. He's telling you that the birds will communicate with you. And that you need to observe and listen. In the case above, there is a pair of scarlet macaws. That particular female refused to nest in a standard box, refused. She would always sit in that corner on the floor of her cage. I gave her an open box. She immediately laid and she, she bred. You see the female incubating an egg and a chick. I did, not li I did listen to that pair. She did not want a regular nest. She wanted something special. And if we look at our birds' behaviors, they communicate with us and they teach us. There is a big difference between expecting the birds to do what we want them to do and us providing the birds with what they want so that they breed. It's very important to listen to the birds and to provide them with what they want. Next. I do not believe that a nest should ever be filled with shavings. In the wild, and I have seen 87% of all parrot species in the wild, I have scars, I have had malaria, I have butt fly uh, scars on my body. These observations have shown me that nest preparation is key and that they must spend several weeks in preparing the nest. We give our birds nest boxes, we use metal nest boxes because it keeps them from digging out and escaping. We have many wild parrots here in Florida. <clears throat> so we give them a metal nest, but we fill it up with chunks of wood, any type of wood. Generally, we cut perches that are small, that have been chewed, and we fill up the nest. There's several reasons for this. When they work the nest, when they must chew this wood and make their own nesting material, we change the male's focus from being aggressive towards the female. His focus is on preparing the nest. We keep them together, so we increase that pair bond, that affection between the pair, and the darkness that they experience while they are making the nest induces sexual activity. You will see a dramatic difference from giving a pair a nest with shavings to giving a pair a nest with wood that they must work at, that they must prepare. This is what happens in the wild. We need to duplicate it by adding wood to the nest. Next. Never is an egg considered worthless, no matter how much damaged, how aberrant it may look. If an egg is damaged, if an egg has an unusual eggshell, we don't ever discard an egg. We always try to hatch it. And in many times, we are very successful. Next. We remove eggs using a very simple procedure because we don't want the female to thrash about and break the eggs when they see us reaching in to get them. Next. So we use a nail, uh, uh, an egg whisk. The, the prongs come apart, they encapsulate the egg, you pull it out, the bird is focused on you and not on the egg being removed. We reduce the risk of that female breaking that egg. She's focused on me, she's not focused on what I'm doing inside her nest. Next. If an egg is damaged, we use glue, we repair it. It is amazing how many eggs have lost albumin, the egg white, and can still be hatched. Next. But many of these eggs that have been damaged, or if they have bubble, have bacterial problems. 
and the bacteria will kill the chick between 12 and 21 days. There are ways around this, and we can use a drug called piperacillin. It is the only drug that works. And we inject an egg, a macaw egg, for example, with 0.02% uh, ml, sorry, 0.02 ml in the air cell. And we do this three times. If we can inject an antibiotic inside the egg cell, the, the chick is protected from this bacterial growth, and we can hatch eggs that have bubbles inside, that have been cracked, that have been soiled on the inside through a crack, a nail puncture. We don't discard an egg. We fight to hatch it. Next. And the drug of choice is piperacillin and we do it in that time frame that I've indicated above. We inject the egg three times. That is the dose. That is the only drug that works. No other antibiotic has worked. In fact, most of the others have killed embryos. Next. When you incubate, people tend to believe that a nest has to be a swamp, that an incubator has to be a swamp, that it has to be very, very humid. In fact, that excessive humidity makes breathing difficult for that egg. The eggs breathe when there is cooling and when there is normal humidity. So we use the orchid uh, principle. We put an orchid plant in our incubation room. If the tip of the flower dies, we know that humidity is at a critical stage and we need to humidify the room, not the incubator. We run all of our incubators dry. We incubate at 37.4, 37.3, and we try to achieve about a 48% humidity. If we can achieve that humidity level, we can hatch an egg. Next. We try to uh, make sure that the eggs have no vibrations because vibrations affect embryo, particularly at the beginning stages of development and we want the eggs to cool. In the wild, the parents leave the nest for periods of five minutes to one hour. I recommend about five minutes cooling per day. And when we cool the eggs, we move them around. We play chess with them. Because in a nest, the eggs don't sit in the same spot. They move from here all the time because the female moves them around. We create the same effect. Because an egg at the front, at the rear, or at the edges of an incubator is going to receive a different temperature than at the center. So we want all these eggs to have equal cooling. You can reduce mortality significantly by allowing a five-minute cooling and ensuring that the eggs are moved around. And why is cooling important? Eggs breathe when there is a temperature change, when there is a lot of heat, they breathe in. When there's cooling, so we want an air exchange inside that egg chamber, inside the egg, in the egg cell. Next. If an egg hatches in the wrong area, there are always solutions. It is very easy to give up. It takes challenge to hatch an egg that's had problems. Next. If an egg dies, we don't discard it. We look at it. We want to know what was the cause of death. And when we find repeated embryos that die from a particular pair, that is telling us that there is a bacterial infection in one of the adults that's being transmitted into the egg and killing the chick. When parrots mate, their cloacas touch. They defecate through their cloacas. So there is bacteria there. If there is excessive bacteria, that bacteria will penetrate the egg and kill the embryo. When we culture a pair, when we take a culture from a pair because the eggs have died repeatedly, we take the throat. We take the choena. The choena is the slit at the roof of the mouth. That will be a mirror that will give us a view into the bird's health. And many times, 
80% of the times. Repeated egg deaths are from a bacterial infection. We culture the female. We find it, we treat it, and the problem is resolved. Next. So when an egg dies, in this case, it's pseudomonas. Find out. Necropsy it. Have it necropsy. Take a culture. You will get a lot of information that could be very vital and that will make you much more successful. Next. I started hand rearing long, long ago. I am 59 years old. I have been an able culturist for 45 years. This was the first hyacinth macaw that I bred, and that was in 1979. Next. At the time, there was no commercial hand rearing formula. We prepared formulas using monkey chow and water. That was all that was available. Today, there are commercial preparations. I use uh, Vercelli Laga brand here, um, but there are many brands available. I don't recommend mixing ingredients because you will never have the same result. The chicks need a certain level of calcium, a certain level of minerals. Taking baby cereal, beans, and fruits, and vegetables, and grinding them up into a gruel is not the same results. And why is that important? Because what you put into that baby bird is what you're going to get out. If there is a deficient diet, that bird will take far longer to reproduce. That bird will have health issues. You need to look at a bird as a savings bank. What you put in is what you're going to get out. If you put in one coin, you're going to get out one coin. If you put in 100 coins, you're going to get out 100 coins. So in the 1970s, we knew very little about hand rearing. And I decided I was going to investigate. And I spent, um, during three years, a lot of time in South America checking. Next. I looked at Amazona Stiva, the blue-fronted Amazon, next. I hired a team of tree climbers. They would climb the tree, next. They would drop the chicks to me. They would send them down. I would weigh them. I would check them. I would take crop contents, and then I would return them to the nest. I wanted to know what food they were getting what percentage of fat, what was so important that the parents were feeding to make these chicks healthy. Next. And what that showed me was that fat was key. A small variable, if they do not get enough fat when they're young, it affects growth, and that growth affects reproduction, how quickly those birds reproduce. There is the data from uh, chicks fed a low-fat diet, what the parents were feeding, and a diet supplemented with fat. Next. Here you see it again. The chick on the right was fed a low-fat diet. The chick on the left was fed a high-fat diet. Next. So what you need to feed fat in the diet, and you either use a macaw formula for all species, once they begin to feather out, you need to reduce the fat in eclectus and in cockatoos. But South American parrots, Amazons, macaws, you can continue to feed that high fat until they're weaned. When you breed birds, you need to be prepared for anything because birds will breed when they want or when you stimulate them. You have some control, but not absolute control when they will breed. Next. Um, and you need to be prepared because sometimes the parents will neglect the chicks. There you see a classic case. The parents ignored, stopped feeding that chick. Had a room not been prepared to take that chick out, it would have died. Next. No chick should be allowed to die. Uh, you need to fight to save every chick, no matter how it looks or how it hatches. 
In this case, this hawk-headed parrot was being strangled by the umbilical cord that wrapped around its neck. Next. In this case, the chick hatched with an unretracted egg yolk. And in that case, you tie it. You do not cut it. You tie it to strangle it with dental floss and you apply sugar. You apply white sugar, white cane sugar, not beet sugar. It has to be sugar cane sugar. Next. There's the sugar. Next. And that's the chick. You never give up. You always fight for success. Next. When chicks, and I get this call, I get this problem on a daily basis. I answer about 200 messages from across the world. And I would say that 10% of the messages from across the world, it doesn't matter whether it's US or Europe or Asia or the Middle East. It has to do with chicks swelling up having a very fat belly, or cockatoo chicks turning white. This is caused by clostridium. Hygiene is imperative. I do not accept that you cannot clean birds that are breeding because they will be, you will disrupt the process. Parrots will adapt to anything you get them used to. We clean our cages, we pressure wash them constantly. Nursery hygiene is utmost. The water quality is utmost. In this case, the particular chicks were fed water that was believed to be clean. They were using bottled water, but the, the bowls, the syringes, everything was being washed in tap water that was contaminated. They, were, they contracted. They became infected with uh, clostridium and would have died. When that happens, you need to use metronidazole flagell suspension. Next, there's a case of cockatoos and eclectus suffering from, from clostridium. This is a common problem. Just this past week, I received a dozen messages from the Middle East over this problem. If you address it, you can save it. The longer you wait, the greater the chance that chick will die. Next. When you, when you look at it, they look very heavy in the bottom. They have trouble because what happens is clostridium causes bleeding in the intestinal tract and that stops food from going through. So they can't defecate and they just swell up until they burst. Next. If a chick is born with a twisted neck, we put a brace and many times you have to treat them with antibiotic. Um, Pseudomonas is often the cause, and there are a multitude of antibiotics. If Pseudomonas affects the brain where you see shaking, uh, the only drug that we have ever found to be effective is uh, clafrin, and that is an injectable drug. Uh, none of the other drug, drugs penetrate the brain barrier. Next. And I stress this because I tell a person, the only drug that will work is clafrin. Cefatoxin is another name for it. And they'll come back and say, oh, can I use sulfa drugs? No. If you could have used sulfa drugs, I would have told you. And many times in this back and forth, because they don't, people don't want to listen to information, they lose time and they lose the chicks. If you reach out to me and I tell you, use clafrin, Use Batril. Use Metronidazole. Please follow my instructions. I'm basing my information on 45 years of experience. I have bred 85% of all parrot species. I freely, I freely give you my knowledge. I don't ask anything in return. Follow the instructions or you waste time that many, uh, in many instances will cause death in the chick. You inject clafrin for example, subcutaneously in a chick. There's a case. You don't inject it in the muscle because there's no muscle. You just deposit a drop under the skin. Next. So you need to also look at the physiognomy of a chick. Uh, 
Deropteus hawkheads have a swollen uh, muscle at the back of the neck. You see this in macaws. Every year, I get a message from somebody that has taken and has punctured the muscle thinking that there is fluid there. Understand the physiognomy of the chick. If you have any doubts, reach out. Don't go ahead and start cutting or puncturing um, because of this. Another point that I would like to stress is homeopathic medicine, apple cider vinegar. All of these things work, but they don't work in a crisis. They work if you're beginning to experience a very light problem, a very light yeast condition, for example. Not a very aggressive yeast that has infected the entire mouth of the chick. Next. We like to use a spoon. A spoon is natural. We start chicks off with a spoon and we finish them with a spoon. We do this because when that chick becomes a pet, if there is a problem, it will be very easy to get that chick to take food again from a spoon. Just this past week, I got a call from a veterinarian. He looked at the leg band of a chick. Uh, the bird had become sick. The people had owned it for several years. Uh, they, uh, they took it camping. The bird drank suspect water. It became sick. It ended up at the vet. And the vet called me and said, hey, you did something that I really appreciated. What is that? You taught that bird to eat from a spoon. The bird to grab it and force feed it is very traumatic. It readily took food with medication from a spoon and it saved the bird's life. Keep this in mind when you rear young for either future breeders or pets. Next. There are many tools that you can use for hand feeding. Gavage needles. Um, syringes, spoons. Um, I like to start with a spoon and then I switch to a gavage needle. When you feed macaws, you need to hold the head and just put a tip of, the tip of the tube in there because they pump so hard that you can tear the, the, the throat lining. So make sure you don't stick it all the way. Make sure you hold the head and you discharge it. Next. Again, you don't mix parent-reared chicks with incubator hatch chicks. You isolate them. You keep them separate. If you must keep them in the same area, you always feed incubator hatch chicks first and then parent hatch chicks. Next. If you do that and you prepare formula all at once, use little plastic cups. Fill it up and write the, the, the brooder number on the cup. That way you're not mixing tools, feeding equipment from one brooder to the next. You can feed all the chicks in the same brooder with the same, but when you're switching brooders, try to use different, different tools. Next. When you prepare formula, if you microwave it and you improve the fat, you can use peanut butter, almond butter, cashew butter, not olive oil, not coconut oil, it separates. You need a butter, uh, an almond butter or a, a peanut butter. Every day I get messages from people saying, can I use soybean oil? No, you cannot. It will affect the plumage of the young. Use peanut butter or use almond butter. You dissolve it in hot water first and then you add your formula. Next. If you rear things like palm cockatoos, after you prepare your formula, you add something that is chunky. Palm cockatoos, golden conures, and hyacinth macaws do not like a creamy formula. They need chunky. And you achieve the chunkiness by adding chopped broccoli, chopped vegetables, chopped nuts. It's very important to raise them or they will die. Next. And when you finish preparing your formula, if you use that in the microwave, you agitate it so that there is, the temperature is even throughout the formula and you take a digital reading. I like a digital thermometer. I get a, a surface reading and I know that it is at 40 degrees Celsius, which is what we feed at. If you overfeed, uh, if you feed a temperature that is too cold, they reject it. If it's too hot, you will cause severe burning. Next. And that's a classic case of burning. 
If you burn a crop, you need to cool it as quickly as possible with water. You need to um, give the chick antifungal antibiotics and Celebrex. Celebrex is for inflammation because if not, you will cause so much swelling that the chick will not be able to digest anything and it will die. This can be avoided if you're just a little bit careful. Next. That's what happens. Somebody calls me with something like that. It's very difficult to save a chick like that because they fed it excessively hot formula and they didn't do anything. You need to cool it down as quickly as possible if you make that mistake. And you need to avoid making that mistake using a thermometer. Next. Many people wait for the first defecation, for the chick to defecate before they start feeding. I do not. I feed instantly. Um, next. I'm sorry, calls are coming in and I tried to block them, but they seem to get through from work. And then we feed them instantly. We feed them the minute they hatch. Um, we do this because the parents do this. I do not know where people came up with, give them Pedialyte for the first 24 hours, give them coconut water for the first 24 hours. That's not what happens in the nest. Next. We keep the chicks full throughout the day because this is what happens. If a chick has digestive problems because you're keeping the crop full, you're making a mistake. That's not normal. We keep our chicks full throughout the day. We feed at 6 a.m. I do the first feeding. The last feeding is at 11 p.m. I do the last feeding. I have a worker that feeds throughout the rest of the day, and they are fed every two hours. I would rather feed less than keep some food in the crop then feed, um, feed more often, feed continuously every two hours, then feed them three times a day, have the chick starve, have them waste a lot of energy trying to get fed. I want that chick to sleep. I want all that energy going into the body to be used for growth. Next. If you have a, a pendulous crop because you tried to cut corners, you tried to feed them, 120 mLs three times a day, you're creating a problem. And the problem here is that the entry into the, the, the stomach is below, is above the sagging crop. So food that sits here can't get through this hole. So you need to raise it so that the crop is like this. And you do that by using a bra. Next. And you just lift it. We weigh chicks regularly. We want to know if they are growing well. If a chick loses weight before it is weaning, there is a problem. Next. We made sure that they are kept warm. Um, I had someone this week contact me from Kuwait. Somebody told them, you take a chick that's been incubator hatched at 37.4 and you keep it at 35 degrees. He was losing everything. You need to transition slowly. You need to start a newly hatched chick at 37.0 degrees Celsius. That differential is so insignificant from hatching that you will save them. If they chill, they cannot thermoregulate. They will die. Next. If you live in a cool climate, you want to feed the chick on a heated surface. You want to make sure that the chick is not going to chill. Next. And we keep them covered. We keep them covered because light stimulates them. Many of them suffer from, from the light. So we just keep a dark towel over the brooders. In the nest, they would be dark. They're not in a brightly lit room. Only when they are feathering out do we keep them uncovered. Next. If a chick has aspirated, is ill, give it oxygen, and if you need to, uh, aerosol the, the, the brooder. It's very important to have a tank of oxygen. If you aspirate a chick, the factor that will save it or let it die is oxygen. 
Put it on oxygen immediately while you figure out what the next steps are. But put it on oxygen and keep it on oxygen until uh, several days have gone by. Next. We, um, we, I micromanage my birds. I have staff. Um, I work for, for a fuel company. I don't micromanage my staff. I macromanage them, but my birds I micromanage. I want to know everything that goes on. And it is this micromanagement that has allowed me to come up with some very interesting ideas that are now widely used. Um, so I have cameras everywhere. Next. We were losing uh, kites from day one constantly. I couldn't figure out why until the cameras gave me the secret. They would get fed, and in hand rearing, the formula is much more liquid than what the parents would be feeding. So what happens is the chicks would eat, would flip themselves on their back, and would aspirate. Simply by looking at video, observing that, and putting them in little cups where they're like a penguin. They can't move around. They can't throw themselves on their back. We saved them. Next. If you keep uh, species like macaws that tend to become frightened and throw themselves on their back, keep a small night light on. Or before you go into the room, talk. I have seen many people lose macaw chicks because they go into a room, they turn on the light, the chick gets frightened, throws itself on its back, and aspirates. Let the birds know you're coming inside. Next. African parrots feed on their backs. This is normal. Understand that. Next. Hygiene. I did some consulting work for this particular aviary. They wanted to know why the chicks were dying. I think hygiene is very clear. In the nest, they can be, the nest can get soiled, but their immune system is very stimulated. It's not like that in, in, in a brooder. It's not like that when a chick is incubator hatched. Next. Species like cockatiels, um, ringnecks are very, very susceptible to polyoma and a number of other diseases. You need to make sure that if you have ringnecks or cockatiels, they are tested and you exclude any bird with polyoma. Every year, every year, I get a thousand messages saying, my chicks have bruising. What do I do? They have polyoma. It's a virus. It's very difficult to to handle because it will survive in wood. My recommendation is you destroy all wooden perches, you destroy everything that's wood, you wash down your walls with soap and water, you disinfect, you test, and you eliminate infected birds. Because if you don't, it will be very difficult to control. And it is deadly, it is brutal to eclectus, kites, in a number of other species. Polyoma can be vaccinated. There is a, a vaccine manufactured here in the US. That vaccine is not widely available and that vaccine is used for chicks. Um, so there is a vaccine, but it's not widely available. Exclude birds. Spend a little money, a little bit of money testing birds. You will save yourself a lot of headaches. Next. you know, dehydrated chicks, emaciated chicks. They need attention. You can't just feed a chick a little bit and forget about it. They need to be on a regular schedule. Next. When a chick stops digesting, you can use apple cider vinegar, you can use cumin water. Nothing works as well as papaya cream. If you take something from this presentation, let it be this you will save a lot of chicks. If the crop stops, you take some papaya flesh, the seeds, and Pedialyte, and you make a cream out of it, and you see the cream in the little bowl, and you give that to the chick solely. That will get the crop to move. Once the crop is moving naturally, 
then you start incrementing the formula. So crop is moving, you start with 75% papaya cream, 25 formula. 50% formula, 50% papaya cream. 75% formula, 25% papaya cream. You slowly increase it. Next. Yeast, this is a classic case in hyacinths. Uh, this needs to be treated. Next. This is polyoma. This is a huge problem. Note the bruising, blood in the crop. Uh, this is a problem. And if you have it, get rid of the breeding stock, disinfect, and start fresh. You can try all kinds of herbal things, all kinds of remedies. I've heard everything from washing the birds in seawater to giving them uh, cumin tea. We're dealing with a virus. It doesn't respond to that. Next. If you use the polyoma vaccine, you must also use enrofloxacin simultaneously or some of the chicks will become neurological and die. If you use the two together, uh, you overcome these problems. Next. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm trying to go fast, and I'm hoping this is being recorded so they can come back to it because there's so much information I want to share. Yes, it is recorded, actually, and uh, I just posted the first part of it. Okay, okay. Maybe you want to mention that in Arabic, please, for those that may not understand English so fluently. Yes. Yeah. Uh, احنا طبعا قاعدين نسجل السيشن حاليا وبينزل في اكونت محمد النيدي وممكن بعد توني ينزله في اكونته فاللي حاب يرجع عقب ويشوف الفيديو مره ثانيه بيكون موجود ان شاء الله. اوكي توني يو كان اوكي سو وي وي ادريس ذا بيترو وذ ا بوليوما فيروس نيكست. If a chick has splayed legs, you bring them together with a sponge. The sponge provides support. Uh, so it doesn't feel uncomfortable. It doesn't roll on its side. Next. If a chick has prognathism where the top mandible goes into the bottom, you can do a number of things. You can next. You can put, for example, the Moluccan chick on the right was born with the beak the top beak was going into the bottom. We took crazy glue. We glued a piece of straw to force the upper mandible out. And you see the chick was perfect. Next. The other option is at night, right before you go to bed, to put the beak together and to use duct tape, a strong tape to, to hold the mandibles in place. If you do that, you will resolve the prognathism. Next. Deviated crops, it happens quite often in macaws. You resolve that by feeding from both sides. You don't just feed from one side. You feed from one side and the other. I understand that creates some risk. But remember, you're not shoving anything in and you're stimulating the chick by touching the pressure points before you feed. There's a video on my Facebook page and on my Instagram page that shows us how you stimulate them to feed. Next. And that's how you feed. You align the beaks. So with my, with my index finger, I'm pushing one way. With my thumb, I'm pushing the other way. So that I've got the lower mandible in one direction, the top mandible in one direction, and they're aligned. They're making a perfect line. Next. If macaws want to, the macaws often pump the edge of the container, and that also causes the beaks to deviate. When that happens, just put them in a deep bucket. We use plastic trash cans. Next. If the, the crop hung too much, like I mentioned, you use a bra. And the bra basically is tied in the back of the neck and behind the wings, and it just picks up the crop as you see there. Next. When you want to wean macaws, I always add chunky food, and we do this. We, we add chopped nuts to the formula. 
We want the crop to start getting consistency. This also helps with a pendulous crop, a stretched out crop, because it gives it some rigidity, some work to do, and it forces the muscles to work. Next. If a chick swallows the bedding, you can use paper. They have cellulose bedding here made out of ground up paper. Next. Or you can use a grid. I don't like using a grid because it is unnatural. But that's another option that you can use if they eat the shavings. Generally, when they eat the shavings, they're telling you that they're not getting enough fat in the diet. Next. If you're going to use the birds for breeding, it is important to always rear them with other birds. You want the birds to understand they are birds and not humans with feathers. There's nothing worse in the world than seeing all of these very imprinted birds that were reared single, that become aggressive as they mature because they, they, they want to breed, they think a human is their partner. We always rear chicks together. If the same species is not available next, we rear them with another species, but we never next, we never mix cockatoos and African grays with macaws because the powder downs. What makes their plumage dusty creates an allergic response in macaws. Always rear chicks together, whether they're going to be future breeders or pets. Let the birds understand that they are birds, that they are flocking species, that they have to interact with other birds. It will be one, a much more successful pet, and two, a much more successful breeder when the time comes. Next. Pet. The pet market is the fastest growing sector. I don't like and I don't uh, approve of leg chains. I've seen way too many birds in my years break, uh, break their legs, hang themselves using a leg, a, a leg chain. You can train the birds to stay on their perch. It's far, far healthier for the birds and humane. Next. Introduce chicks to toys and enrichment very young. We want to get these birds to understand that they are birds, that they have to learn to play. If you do this, the bird will be happy playing in its cage and not screaming to be on your shoulder. I'm basing it on 45 years of experience. I want you guys to be successful. I see two huge growth areas in Ava culture, the Middle East and Asia. Don't make the mistakes that we made that cost us tremendously. Learn from our mistakes so you can continue to progress. Next. And you train chicks from a very young age. In this case, they had to come forward when called. They didn't jump on the hand. They were called to jump on the hand. They were given a treat. And then they were told to wait to be fed. These chicks weren't fighting to be fed. They understood that their time would come. Train them from a young age, and you will have a much, much more successful bird. Next. People say hand-reared birds will not rear their young. That is not true. There is one case there. Those are three generations, four generations birds that were parent-reared, that were hand-reared, that were able to rear their young. Next. The adults were hand reared, they had no problem rearing their young. But they were reared to be birds. They were hand reared and given enrichment and kept in groups and allowed to be birds. Next. People say that only hand reared birds pluck. That is not true. Wild birds also pluck. It's important to understand this. Because many of the, the attackers of aviculture say that when we hand rear birds, we're creating a monster that plucks, that screams, that becomes sexually overaggressive. If the bird is properly reared, it behaves exactly like it does in the wild, and wild parrots pull their feathers. So it's not just an artifact of captivity. These are photos of wild birds. Next. Next, PDD, proventricular dilation, uh, 
It is a problem. It is a worldwide problem that has no solutions. But before you euthanize a bird for potentially having PDD, make sure it's tested because many other pathogens, including megabacteria or an excessive yeast, will also cause complete seeds to go through. And when you feed parrots, the ideal diet is pellets because they contain everything. In the 1970s and 80s, we saw so many birds dying in the U.S. and so many birds becoming sick, and it was dietary related. When you feed pellets, 70% pellets, 30% vegetables, you eliminate deficiency. If you feed seeds, you need to feed a tremendous variety and pay a lot of attention to vegetables. Why am I not mentioning fruit? In the wild, parrots eat fruits green, so they don't compete with many mammals, uh, with many frugivorous birds, so they avoid this competition by eating the fruit green. When they eat it green, there is a very low sugar content. Parrots have not evolved to eat all these sugary foods. You don't give dates to parrots. You don't give sugar cane to parrots. Those things are very sweet, and they will eventually cause a massive yeast growth in the intestine and in the mouth. Next. If you give dates, you give fresh dates, not dry dates. Next. Um, papillomas are, are highly contagious. It is quite common in macaws and hawk-headed parrots from Suriname and Guyana. Uh, there is no treatment. Uh, it is highly contagious, but the birds can live with it for years. If a bird contracts it, you must feed it hot peppers daily for the rest of its life. That will keep it under control. It will not cure it, but it will keep it under control. If you breed from those birds, you want to disinfect those eggs before incubation. And you disinfect them by wiping them down with hydrogen peroxide and then placing the egg in an ultraviolet chamber. The little chambers the, the barbers use to disinfect scissors and cones. You put the egg in there for five minutes after wiping it down with hydrogen peroxide. Next. If a bird eats eggs all the time, one solution is you take a regular egg, you use cleaning ammonia, you inject the egg, and you put it inside the nest. Generally, they'll break these ammonia-filled eggs once, twice, three times, and then they stop. You can also stop them oftentimes by just increasing the depth of the nest. The deeper, the darker the nest, the smaller the nest, the less likelihood of them breaking eggs. Next. When you uh, have a bacterial problem, when you have an issue, you just don't start giving them all antibiotics. You do cultures. The cultures will teach you what antibiotic to use. The sensitivities will, will guide you. Next. And people say, well, there's no bird vets in my, house, in my area. A culture and sensitivity can be done by any lab. It could be a chicken lab, a, a veterinary hospital for dogs. They can do that. It's very standard. We do it here at home. When you look at a bird, when you take a culture, you take it from the roof of the mouth, and when you buy a bird, you look at it for health. You want to make sure there are hairs in the roof of the mouth. If that area is swollen, there's a bacterial problem. If that area has no hairs, there's a bacterial problem. Look at that photo. Compare it to the next. Oh, sorry. I thought there was a, an intermediate photo. I tried to reduce many images because of the, the size of the presentation and the time limitation. If there are hairs growing in the roof of the mouth, the bird is healthy. If there are no hairs and the area looks warm or opaque or inflamed, there is a problem. That's the best way to tell whether a bird is healthy or not. Next. When you use Batril in eclectus, you will get feather pinching. This is quite common. Also in cockatoos, it does not mean beak and feather. It means you have overdone the batrel. You have abused it. Avoid using antibiotics unless it is utterly necessary. Next. People say aviculture is dying. It's not true. It's growing. We have to stand up for our rights to keep birds. We have to exchange information. The old breeders kept everything secret. That's not the way to advance the hobby. 
I willingly give what I know, and I encourage breeders across the world to do the same. I will answer the question from somebody having a problem with a palm cockatoo baby or a hyacinth macaw baby just as readily as I will answer uh, a request for information from a 12-year-old breeding budgies for the first time. We need to share information. Next. I thank you for this opportunity, and maybe we can take some questions. Yes. So, uh, Tony, I have a few questions. I, I wrote down a few questions from uh, some uh, of the audience. Let me just bring them up. Okay. Maybe you can switch to your face from the screen, and that way they can also see you. Yeah, I will, actually. I'm thank you. Trying to find the questions. Uh, okay. So first, let me thank you for your time, Tony. That was very uh, informative and very uh, nice presentation. I'm sure I, I everyone- I tried to a lot into one- yeah, I know, I know. But uh, it, it had a lot of information and I'm sure everyone uh, will go uh, from here having more information than before. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Uh, let's take a few questions from here. So uh, so uh, someone is asking, I've got an adult, uh, I've got adult macaws. They weren't tame and I'm worried if I allow them to breed or have chicks, then they will they are tame now, and they they will become not tame. So, so yes, that's, that's, that's the problem. When you breed macaws, you will. When you breed tame birds, you will lose them, no question. Okay. But okay. but my response to that is, you're going to lose the parents, but you're going to have babies to play with. You can keep the babies for four or five years as pets, and then give them an opportunity to breed when they mature. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, <clears throat> if if uh, if the bird breeds once and then we remove the chicks, does this make them stop breeding? No, no. Um, they will continue to lay. They're cycled. Uh, we we take chicks. We take eggs every year. And we take chicks. We do give the pairs an opportunity to rear young um, all the time. But uh, no, that does not stop them in the wild. Very few chicks ever fledge. They get eaten by lizards, snakes, other birds of prey. Um, they get broken by other birds trying to take over the nest. They have evolved in a very hostile environment where, where losses are very great. So it does not stop them. You shouldn't take every egg and every chick. You should give them an opportunity to rear young. Yeah. But taking, taking a few will not stop them. Okay. And... Uh... <laughs> Is there any behavior differences between babies hatched under the parents or babies hatched in incubators? None. It's, it's what you put into the birds. If you allow those babies to interact with each other, if you allow them to experience enrichment, and enrichment is favored over toys. Enrichment could be palm seeds. You, you, you could give them the raw dates, not the, the dried dates that you would eat. Uh, during Ramadan to break your fast. I'm talking about, you see, I know quite a bit. Uh, uh, you would take the, the dates from the tree. You would give them palm branches. You could give them anything. Okay. Just to get them to interact. We give them green coconuts. Okay. Yeah. So, Just one uh, thing. Uh, niña, un café. Gracias. Sorry, I was asking somebody, my hand feeder, to, okay. um, venga acá, niña. Back a moment. I'm going to introduce you to my hand feeder. She is, okay. um, she's my baby's mama. Uh, this is uh, Cindy. Bing, bing, bing. She hand feeds all the babies. Es una conferencia que está dando en el Medio Oriente. And um, she takes care of them uh, probably better than I do. Okay. Let me know if she wants to work in Doha. Oh, I'm sure she, um, <laughs> she likes, I have had some very good hand rearers and I find that yeah. women are very good. And I always get people that have no experience because that way I can train them how I want. 
I have found that if I bring someone with experience, that can be a problem because they try to do what they want. Yes. What I can offer is if you get somebody that wants to come here during the breeding season, we have room. We always take people in to train them. We okay. always have people coming. And I think they will always walk away with a lot of experience. We have them come from private collections in zoos, veterinarians, across every specter. And we willingly share, and, and they see our successes and our failures. Because in aviculture, not every, uh, everything we do is a success. Yeah, so, correct. So I have uh, another question. Uh, someone is asking about the free flying birds. So if, if he's practicing this, this free flight, uh, outdoor free flight, does this affect the breeding? So if no. he goes, the same birds go into breeding, they will forget how to go and come back again to fly free flight? You, you read, you, they don't forget, they will pick it up. There used okay. to be a place here in Miami called Parrot Jungle. And Parrot Jungle was started in the 1930s. And they would let out 150 macaws. They were the one, first ones to let macaws fly free. The macaws would fly free. They were put away at night in pairs. Uh, the two birds that stuck together were put together. If they bred, they were allowed to breed, rear the chicks, and then they were allowed to free fly again. And uh, I think you didn't understand my question. You know, now some people, they take it as a hobby. They go outdoor yeah. and leave their birds. Yes. And then they call them back again. Yeah. So does this affect, this practice affect the, if they go into no. breeding? No, okay. not at all. Not at all. all, right. all right. In Perry Jungle was the case. They would allow the birds to free fly all day and they would breed from them. And then they would let them free fly again and breed them. Okay, perfect. And... Okay, um, and a, a question again, another question. Uh, many breeders face a problem of the pair eating the chicks. How can we avoid this? It's diet, it's nest box. First of all, nest boxes should be deep. For a pair of Amazons, for example, I recommend a nest box uh, 30 centimeters square, 90, 90 centimeters to 120 centimeters deep, one. Two. Um, that's telling me that there's protein deficiency there. Okay. Uh, they need protein and they need fat. Parrots in the wild nest when there's protein and there's fat. Look at the diet. Review the diet and make modifications to it. Okay. And I don't know how long, how, how much time you have, Tony, so please let me know whenever you're... We'll, continue, for, we'll continue the cycle until okay. they, they take us away. And then we will plan another one. Okay, so that's good. So uh, another question is about hybrid macaws. So is it correct that uh, let's say uh, fifth generation they don't breed? Maybe if we go like to another generation, third generation, fourth generation, and then they will stop breeding? No, no, no. They will breed. The problem that we find with some of these macaws is that there are lethal genes. You see lethal genes when you breed a harlequin to a harlequin, for example, where many of the chicks grow deformity. I think you need to always try to pair a hybrid back to a, a wild parent, but there are five and six generation hybrids out there. Uh, there's few, but they are out there. They, they don't become sterile. All right. Uh, and... Uh... Okay, a uh, question about uh, beans. So if we know that the dry beans are a bit, uh, not very good for the parts. Correct, so because if, they, have, they have compounds that block the absorption of calcium. Yeah, so if we keep the beans in, a, in water for 24 hours and then feed them, is this enough or we need nope. to keep it? You need to let it sprout so that there is a molecular change or you need to boil them to break the, the fiber. Okay. And you can boil them just, you know, a few minutes. You don't have to cook them to a mush. What I like, what, what the birds like and what's very good are garbanzo, ses, I believe you call them in, in Arabic sesi, sesi beans. Uh, the garbanzo beans are round. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I got this, yes. So we have a few more questions here. Let me check. 
so someone is, ask, uh, is asking, uh, do we give any antibiotics after uh, uh, after the bird gets weaned? So many no. people think that you have to give the chick something to like antibiotics or maybe uh, a vaccination to protect the chick. So you, no. we get always this question, you know, is it vaccinated? Is it vaccinated? If you vaccinate, you would vaccinate. The only vaccine available is polyoma, and you would vaccinate um, kikes, uh, okay. eclectus, uh, just a few species. I don't believe you want to give them antibiotic, first of all, because their immune system has not been fully developed. And secondly, they need the gastric bacteria that's good uh, to grow. If you give antibiotics, there has to be a reason. I do believe in probiotics. And that's something, maybe when somebody asks, did you give antibiotics, you could say, no, we're giving probiotics. And you give them a probiotic in the food daily. We do it here with our macaws during the rainy season. Macaws get bacterial infections easy during the rainy season. We circumvent that by giving them probiotics. Okay. So I have one more question, which is, is it easy to... Is it easy to breed Major Mitchell and Kuwait? Is there any difference in breeding uh, birds like in USA or in Kuwait or in anywhere else? If you provide them with the proper condition, no. First of all, Major Mitchells come from a dry climate. Um, they don't come from a wet climate. So your climate is far more favorable to breeding them than us. The problem is when the temperature goes above 40 degrees, it's a critical problem. And yeah. um, we use here in the Midwest, in the, the American West, where we experience very high and warm climates, we use something called a swamp cooler, where it basically injects very fine uh, water into the air, micromisters, to reduce the temperature. And I've been working with one collection, we were able to reduce it by 10 degrees. 10 degrees Celsius is significant just by the proper application of micro-misters. Okay. Yeah. Very good. So I think, Tony, that's it. Uh, these are like uh, most of the questions we have received. Uh, I really thank you for your time. My and, pleasure. Uh, the owner of this account is actually thanking you by name so for, have, for uh, giving us this My time pleasure. and opportunity. Uh, I'm sure we will have uh, another session. Maybe we plan something else about di dietitian or di diet, yeah. parents diet, and we can talk uh, in another day. But it thank would you be so much for your time. Yes. Uh, you it so would be my pleasure. And we need to organize a convention in the future in the Middle East. Of course. I think we will be very happy to have you here anytime. I think the potential there is massive. Yeah. Massive. I think that um, we will get very, very big surprises at what's being accomplished there. And it's important for us all. It does not matter where we live. We have something that links us tremendously, and that's the passion for bird keeping. Yeah. And we need to stay connected. We need to exchange information. And learning is a two-way street. I always learn something as readily as they learn from me. I, again, I thank you for this opportunity. I wish everyone safety during these very difficult uh, times. COVID-19 has really uh, created some major problems for a lot of people. Stay healthy, stay in touch, and share the passion you have for bird keeping. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Bye-bye. Thank you. And I hope you will get your videos in the account of Bird Dealer. Thank you. Thank you.